Does it really matter whether Noah's flood was global or local? That is the discussion that we're going to be having on this week's episode of The Winsome Creationist. Now, it's going to be in the format of another response video to Gavin Ortland. And I really love Gavin. He's a great Christian brother. I love the way that he articulates things. He's just so kind and so compassionate. I think he's wrong on this issue, and we're going to talk through some of those things. But we're going to do it in a winsome way and in a way that is becoming a, a great Christian conversation. So one caveat as we kind of go through this thing, I am a little bit under the weather, so I'm going to, I might have to stop here and there. So there might be a couple cuts, you know, to, to kind of get through that. Otherwise though, I plan to roll through this and just respond to the things that I see needing a response and we'll go from there. I'm also going to play this video at one and a half times speed. It'll just make it a little bit quicker to go through. And if you're listening on audio, you might want to come over to the video for this one, but you certainly don't have to. All right, without further ado, let's dive right in. In this video, I want to address whether the flood of Noah was local or global. So did it cover the entire planet or just some large territory in Mesopotamia? As controversial as this topic is, believe me, I, I, I'm aware. <laughs> and we'll, let, we'll have a respectful working it through. I'll read your comments very carefully. But I've made a personal resolution to never shy away from topics that fit with the goal of my channel, which is to help people feel peace and assurance in the gospel. And that means talking through these difficult issues that cause people anxiety. This is definitely one of them, partly because of the disagreements that happen within the body of Christ, but also because of the contempt that comes upon us from secular critics like this one. I don't know about the elephants on Noah's Ark, but the elephant in the room in 2014 is that we are now a full four centuries removed from the scientific revolution. Four centuries after Copernicus, after the time humans... Now, let me just say right up front, I'm a little bit concerned that he started with a Bill Maher clip, of all things. You know, Bill Maher, again, comic, funny guy, outspoken atheist, no friend of the Bible, that's for sure. But... Gavin's going to make the point sort of later on that, you know, a lot of his beliefs here are scripturally motivated. And I, I want to believe that very strongly. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't have access to Gavin's heart. But, you know, Bill Maher uh, could very easily say the same things or, or do a, a very similar comic sort of routine around the resurrection of Christ. And so, and many other issues in the Bible as well, to be honest. And so it's it's not wise, I think, to start off with a skeptic like Bill Maher sort of setting the temperature for how we should respond to a certain issue. At least that's my feelings on it. Humans realize that through science, we can actually get a real answer to almost every question about our world, like where does the sun go at night? <laughs> and why does disease spread so quickly on a cruise ship? <laughs> And speaking of cruise ships, you know, I don't mind that the Noah story is impossibly childish. Okay, I do mind. What am I saying? I mind very much. I mean, seriously, people, you believe a man, Noah, lived to be 900 years old. That's what the Bible says. And when he was 500, he decided to have three kids, just like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and when he was 600, he and his three 100-year-old sons <laughs> built a boat onto which, in one day, they loaded over three million animals, all of which were apparently indigenous to within five miles of the boat. <laughs> Okay, now, a couple of things that he said there, you know, of course, Bill Maher, it doesn't seem like he's, you know, studied very much creationist material, which is not surprising. But, you know, it does, again, it's setting the wrong kind of temperature, I think, because there are a few things that he mentioned there that it would be easy to buy into. And it kind of does sound like as we go along that Gavin is going to buy into some of these ideas, like three million animals on the ark, you know, that that kind of thing, that is just not the reality of current creationist sort of studies. The other thing that he mentioned is that, you know, he, he rolled through these, these list of facts that, you know, he made a, a couple errors there, but, you know, he said, this is what the Bible says. And for the most part, in what he said, he was right. And so, you know, Bill Maher was taking the Bible sort of at a face value, natural reading, the same way that it has been taken for many thousands of years. And so we sort of either deal with the truth of that or find some ways to get around it. And of course, you know, what, what Gavin seems to be doing here in his video is finding some ways to get around it. And as we go through, I think we're going to see that most of those just don't really work out. But get this, what the Christians who are now protesting this movie are upset about is that it doesn't take the biblical story literally enough. They're mad because this made-up story doesn't stay true to their made-up story. 
So I have basically two motives or goals for this video. First is an apologetics goal. I just want to try to help Christians feel a little bit more equipped to respond to criticisms like that. I've known a lot of people walk away from their faith in relation to this topic and others like it. Maybe some of you watching this video feel you're in that place. The second goal is kind of a unity goal. I want to try to help us think through our differences within the body of Christ in a peaceable way with more understanding of one another and a sense of proportion and, and wisdom about that's those two things are right at the core of Truth Unites with what I hope this YouTube channel is accomplishing. Apologetics and kind of triage and unity and thinking through these important secondary and tertiary doctrines. So this one is really important. I'm not minimizing it. Now, I'm not going to deal with the morality of this story. Like, is God immoral for killing people and that kind of thing? That's a really important thing. Bill Maher and others talk about that as well. I'll have other videos later in this year that really get into some of those questions. Slavery in the Bible, the conquest of Canaan, really tough topics I'm going to address. In this video, I just want to address one very specific question, and that's the extent of the flood. Was it local or global? And that question is obviously important for how we respond to a Bill Maher, but also how we talk to each other in the church. Here's my thesis. The biblical text can be responsibly read as describing a local flood, and therefore both a local flood interpretation as well as a global flood interpretation are orthodox. Okay, now I agree with this statement, kind of, okay? I definitely think it's fair to say that both a global and a local flood view are orthodox. I mean, they're certainly not heresy. I probably lean more towards heterodoxy, personally, because the overwhelming view of the church and Jewish history has been a global flood, you know, for the last... 6,000 years, you know, I mean, depending on how you look at it. So, yeah, I, I mean, it seems like, especially setting it up in the context of this Bill Maher, you know, routine in the very beginning, it does, it does seem like it's more of a response to modern scientific inquiry than it is motivated by the text. But let's keep going and we'll sort of engage with the arguments he brings up. Whichever one is right and wrong, they're both legitimately Christian. In other words, this isn't an orthodoxy versus heresy issue. Now, I know that some of my, as much as my non-Christian viewers might be thinking that any kind of historical flood is just crazy to believe in, and I'll address that question at the end. A lot of my Christian viewers might be thinking, why would you even entertain the idea of a local flood? It's completely obvious that the Bible's describing a global flood. And I can kind of understand and sympathize with this immediate reaction. If you start reading through Genesis 6 to 8, you stumble upon references to all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven, everything that is on the earth, the face of all the earth, all the high mountains under the whole heaven, and lots of other uh, little phrases and language like this that sounds, especially I'm just on at face value in English translation, it sounds very universal. But if I could just make a plea for people to hear my case here, if you end up disagreeing, that's totally fine. And I'll consider something that I'd like you to keep in mind throughout this video. He just made the case via those scriptures that he put on the screen that it does sound very universal. And so I've never really received a satisfactory answer to the question, well, how would the text be written if it was intending to communicate a global flood? How would the text be written differently if it was intending to communicate a global flood? In other words, I think it's written exactly the correct way to communicate a global flood. So how else would it have needed to be written? That would be my question to Gavin or to any of the others whom he cites throughout this video on like, yeah, how, how would it be written differently in order to accomplish that? I've never really received a satisfactory answer to that. If you have one, please post it in the comments below and be happy to uh, engage with it. Consider your perspective, but I would just invite you to hear my arguments first before you make up uh, whether your mind, whether you disagree with me or not, because this is surprisingly complicated. So the structure of this video is first three lightning quick clarifications just about what it means to talk about a local flood. Second, two arguments for why that's a responsible reading of the text. And then third, a defense of the flood story as a true account of a historical event. Okay, diving in. Three quick clarifications about what is this proposal of a local flood. Number one, local does not necessarily mean small. It just means it didn't cover the entire planet. So a lot of times people will say, you know, well, if it was local, why do you even need an ark? <laughs> why do you just move out of the way, you know? And uh, a lot of people think that the flood was large and sudden and calamitous, but they simply think it doesn't concern Greenland and Japan and the South Pole and so forth. Second clarification, local does not necessarily mean that it, the flood didn't wipe out all human beings outside the ark. Some people think that, others don't. This is before the dispersion of humanity in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. So the flood story is roughly Genesis 6 through 8, chapter 9 is relevant. It's talking about Noah as well. So we're here. Okay, so two things here. The extent of the flood certainly is an issue. I mean, of course, that's what the whole video is about. But in terms of if you have a local flood, what kind of region did it cover? Um, there are different views on this. I think some of the views certainly do have the criticism of like, well, why didn't you just move out of the way, you know, get out of the area sort of thing. Um, 
And some of them are big enough, I think, that that would not be a legitimate criticism of, of that view. I'm more concerned about the issue of the extent of humanity And this one has multiple layers to it, but just to kind of keep it simple, and I'll I'll put myself on the screen here, just to kind of simplify it, you really have three main views. You have a a no-age view, a young-age view, and an old-age view, okay? This is when, when we're talking about people who believe the Bible. There's people who believe that the Bible doesn't teach any sort of age for the earth or humanity or whatever, and that's going to, they're going to primarily accept the evolutionary time scale. Then you got people who take the young age view, right, which I believe is the classic historical orthodox position of the church, and that is going to be the view that humanity and the earth and everything is about 6,000 to 7,000 years old. And then the old age view, which there are some different flavors of, the most common of which is probably Hugh Ross's progressive creationism, which has the standard timelines in terms of the ages, but a more narrow definition of humanity. So Gavin's right that there are some who take the view that the glo- that the uh, local flood did take care of all humanity, but yet was not global. So what they'll do is they'll use the word universal instead of the word global. And the problem with this is a couple things. Number one, if you're an evolutionist, this view is off the table because humanity would have spread long before the flood could have reached all of humanity, okay? So that view is just totally off the table for someone who believes in the standard evolutionary timelines and synthesis. Obviously, if you have the young earth view, the young age view, then you have no problem with all humanity being part of this flood. If you take the progressive creationist view, like Hugh Ross, okay, he can get all of humanity in the flood on his view, but it's expensive. And what I mean by that is in order for him to take that view, he has to deny that Denisovans and Neanderthals are human. Okay. Whereas young earth creationists have been saying since the eighties and even now Dr. William Lane Craig has become so convinced of the humanity of these groups that he wants to place Adam 750,000 years ago. Okay. Because he, he believes that Adam was one of these and that early humanity was a, a Neanderthal or Denisovan, one of those. And so you end up with this situation because we have Neanderthal DNA in our bodies. We end up with this situation where you have theological problems like what does it mean for humans early early humans homo sapiens sapiens which is what you know dr Hugh Ross wants to you know keep that narrow definition of humanity has interbred with these non human yet humanoid creatures basically who had all the characteristics and behaviors and things like that of humans but didn't have the image of god and now we have sort of this dna mixing thing going on It's just an expensive belief. So the old age view, which is what Gavin seems to be pretty much promoting here, is just expensive. I think it's more theologically expensive than young earth creationism is, which is part of why I don't take that view. So let's continue on and keep going. But just just note that the humanity thing, you got to dice with a razor's edge on this stuff. Here in kind of that first section, the primeval history of Genesis. And this is before humanity had been spread out after the Tower of Babel. So lots to get into there. I'm just pointing out you don't have to say a local flood means only one portion of humanity. So for an example of someone who believes in a local flood, but one that is still universal with respect to human civilization, check out the ministry Reasons to Believe. And uh, Hugh Ross has done a lot of work on the flood story. That organization does a lot of great ministry, a lot of great evangelism, great apologetics, and he's a very good proponent of that view. So I'll put a link to some things that he's done on this topic, uh, and I just encourage you to, to, to learn about that perspective. Third, local versus global is not a matter of the truth or historicity of the event. I just want to be really clear on this because sometimes people misunderstand this. I believe that I believe in a historical event that is truly being recorded in the Bible. It really happened. It's a trustworthy account we have in Genesis. That's not the issue here. The issue I'm addressing here is the extent of the water, just that specific issue. Was it local or global? And basically, I just want to dive in and give two reasons why I think it may have been local. And even though I think the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of that and against a global flood, these aren't really scientific arguments. I'm going to make primarily biblical arguments that they make a broader appeal uh, because I'm not a scientist and I'll just keep it focused on the scripture. I think from the scripture alone, you can make a pretty good case. So here's my two arguments. Number one, the same language used in Genesis 6 through 8 that seems so universal is used for local regions all the time throughout the Bible. 
So the phrase, the whole earth, comes from the Hebrew word eretz, meaning land or country or earth or ground. Lots of different ways you can translate it. And then the word kol, meaning all or every. Eretz is used over 2,500 times in the Hebrew Bible. It's translated earth about one-fourth of the time. The phrase kol eretz, all the earth or all the land or all the country, is used about 207 times. And only in about 40 of those might it mean all of planet earth. So in the majority of cases, by a pretty wide margin, kol eretz often has, usually has, a local referent. Now, sometimes you... Of course, that is entirely true. But remember that context always determines meaning, okay? Context always determines meaning. You know that because of a qualifier. So, for example, in the first two occurrences of this phrase in the Bible, Genesis 2, 11 and 13, you have the whole land of Havilah and the whole land of Cush. But even without the qualifier, this is the common meaning. So, years ago, Rich Deem wrote an article that listed 56 examples of Kol Aretz having a local reference in the Hebrew Bible. I'll put up on the screen the first 10 in canonical order, uh, and then on this screen, and then I'll put the next five on the next screen. Okay, so this is, of course, important. But, remember, context determines meaning. And what is the context of the flood story. Okay? Well, the context of the flood story is all of humanity. Why is that? Well, because the context of Genesis 1 through 11 is all of humanity. We don't center in on God's people, Israel, until Genesis 12, okay? In the family of Abraham, which is where the story of Israel begins, okay? In Genesis 1 through 11, what we're dealing with is cosmic sin, cosmic rebellion. In Genesis 3, the fall of humanity into sin. In Genesis 6, the proliferation of sin throughout all of humanity when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and all of men's hearts were evil continually. That's the thoughts of their hearts were evil only continually. That's what the text says. Okay, and so the destruction was to counter a cosmic sin problem. All of humanity is being dealt with here. Same thing, Tower of Babel, all the people of the earth were of one tongue, okay? So God separates them out into different languages, and they develop different cultures. They spread out because they had banded together in order to worship God on their own terms, okay? So this is something that again, from Genesis 1 through Genesis 11, it's always a cosmic thing, right? In Genesis 6, right? So what happens in Genesis 4 and 5? Genesis 4 and 5, it's the explanation of what happened after Adam and Eve were fruitful and multiplied on the earth, right? It's their family spreading throughout the earth, okay? So same thing after Noah gets off the ark, what happens? Well, his family is fruitful and multiplies. The same order is given. It's, it's recreation, it's cosmic language of recreation. When Noah and his family then go out, they go out and spread out throughout the earth and replenish and refill the earth. And the same thing happens with the animals, all right? And so everything is kind of spread out from there. So to say that this is just dealing with one local area of the planet is to deny the context of Genesis 1 through 11. Gavin's absolutely right. These same words are used in local contexts all the time, usually with a qualifier. And even when it's not with a direct qualifier, I would argue that in the vast majority of cases, the context makes it abundantly clear what pieces of land or what regions or what areas are being talked about. But Genesis 1 through 11 is almost undeniably cosmic in scope and in nature. And we have this confirmed by 2 Peter chapter 3, where it talks about the creation the flood, and the coming judgment, okay? All three of these things were cosmic events. Just as the creation was cosmic, just as the judgment will be cosmic, so was the flood cosmic. It's the only way that all of the data seems to make sense to me. You can pause and read through these if you want. Already you can tell, like, you know, a, a translation like, in the land... Is, gives you a very different kind of flavor of meaning than on the earth. But just to give maybe two examples to dive in, Genesis 41, 57 says, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Now, we don't have to conclude that people from northern Siberia traveled down to the Middle East and the ancient Mayans beat Christopher Columbus to the punch in sailing across the Atlantic Ocean and Aboriginal Australians made their way across India or the Indian Ocean to make it to the Middle East. I'm, I'm going to give lots of specific examples throughout this video. In no way am I trying to poke fun at an alternative view. I'm just trying to be specific with what this would mean. So when it says all the earth is afflicted by this famine and they come to Egypt, no one really interprets it, meaning literally like all of planet earth. And this is pretty recurrent all throughout the Hebrew Bible. First Kings 10, 24. Of course, I would say, of course not. But I think just looking at it from like the common sense level, like 
I don't I don't think anybody would interpret this as being all the earth. Again, context dependent, right? When the whole earth comes to Solomon to hear his wisdom, we, we're not required to think that people came from Canada and Brazil and East Asia and so forth to learn from Solomon. And that's true for that the phrase kol eretz, all the earth, but also the other phrases in Genesis 6 through 8 that might seem universal initially, but then you see all throughout the Hebrew Bible, they're used for a local reference. Like the phrase under the whole heaven in Deuteronomy 2.25 doesn't mean that people like Native Americans in the United States at that time are afraid of Moses. Uh, when Elijah is told in 1 Kings 18 that there's no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you, we're not required to think of Ahab's spies going up into Scandinavia, various islands in the world where there's human civilization and so forth. So it is worth noting here, though, that many commentators have made the point that the all-encompassing language being repeated so many times, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, just go read the flood account again, Genesis 6 through 8, and you're going to see that this language is not, you know, it's not just a one-off mention in a passage where a bunch of other stuff is happening, like the specific examples that Gavin is showing. In the flood account, you have all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered, every creature wherein was the breath of life, right? You have these words all and every. It's repeated so many times to a sort of exhaustive, almost ridiculous extent. And that has been highlighted by commentators as being significant in itself, that this was so all-encompassing. It's as almost it's almost as if, again, how else could it have been written? So basically what I'm trying to do so far is just appeal to context, in this case, the, the rest of the Hebrew Bible, to show this kinds of, kind of language has a lot of precedent for having a local reference. Now, then we can just ask, you know, why would that be? Why would they talk like this? And here we just have to try to submit ourselves to what the scripture is trying to communicate rather than immediately make us say, ah, if I could just make an appeal for humility in how we read the Bible. We're reading an English translation with a modern understanding of planet Earth as a round globe orbiting the sun between Venus and Mars. So when we hear certain language, you know, we're going to bring a lot to the table in terms of how we interpret that language. The biblical writers and the original readers were not aware of the South Pole or Alaska or New Zealand. So they would have absolutely no reason to use language that would reflect entities that they didn't know existed. They were just using the ordinary language of the time to refer to the known world. And that's completely natural for people back then to speak like that. When we say all the earth, we just mean all the earth we've ever known, you know? And so our task as, in reading the scripture is to submit to what the original author meant and how the original hearers received the text. That is where meaning is furnished. And actually it's, so one way we respect the scripture is we submit to what it intends to say rather than kind of immediately uh, draw it into our horizon of concerns and all our modern questions, many of which the Bible actually isn't addressing directly. Of course, I completely agree with this. I just think that he's got the context of this passage wrong. And we're going to go into that a little bit more. So I'll address that later when he gets to that specific piece. But yeah, of course, the context determines meaning. We want to submit to the scripture. I would uh, just give a hearty amen to all of that. I would just ask you to consider that the context of Genesis 6 through 8 and 1 through 11 is cosmic in scope. And it's not about just one local area of the world. Even in the New Testament, you'll find comprehensive language to refer to the known world, the Mediterranean world. Colossians 1, six, the gospel bearing fruit in the whole world. Well, we know that, you know, the American continents hadn't been evangelized yet. Acts 2.5 says there were dwelling in Jerusalem uh, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and then the nations are listed. And it doesn't include places like Brazil and Japan and so forth. Now, one factor that supports this way of thinking in Genesis 6 through 8, that we're not thinking globally so much as the known world is Genesis 10, which comes right after. And the, uh, the so-called table of nations, this is listing all of the different nations that are descended from Noah and his sons. And they're all local. They're talking primarily about the Middle East, you know, extent. Okay, so let's stop right here. So this is a piece of the puzzle that's interesting. So I think this is probably the point that he's just made about the table of nations constraining the local context of, of the Genesis 6 story. I think this is probably the only argument that you can make that localizes the context. But notice what he just said. He just said that this is the account, Genesis 10, of Noah's sons and the nations that descended from them as they refilled the earth. Notice what he just said, okay? So, um, logically, this is consistent. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's overwhelmingly consistent with the young age creationist view on this account. This is literally uh, Noah and his family being the only human beings left alive on the planet to do what God said, to replenish and multiply and, and be fruitful and to fill the earth, right? So that the table of nations only mentions the nations descended from Noah 
absolutely makes sense. In fact, it's the only thing that makes sense on a young age creationist global flood framework because Noah was the only person in his family left alive. So could it be used to create a local context in the in these passages? I mean, it's the only hope I think you have uh, of doing that, but I'm just not sure that it works because it it it's better explained on the global flood view, I believe. Extending outward a bit into Asia and Africa and Europe, but we're not talking about Australia and Mexico and Northern Europe and so forth. And that provides more support for thinking that the, the sphere of awareness of the biblical authors was more limited. They were just using the ordinary language of the day to describe the world that they knew. Here's how Michael Heiser uh, helpfully explains this point about Genesis 10. What's the context of the nations in Genesis 1 through 11? What's the context of the world? And the answer is Genesis 10, the table of nations. We have 70 nations there. They're all Eastern Mediterranean, again, from the South, like in Africa, all the way up you know, to, the, to what we would call the Caucasus now. And so some people will argue that is the context for the flood. That is the landmass that was affected by the flood. That is a region. It is not an entire globe. And so this view says it makes sense then since the people who lived in Canaan from, which these, from whence these giant clans came, where they live? They lived in these places described in Genesis 10. They the Amorites, the Hittites from Anatolia, the Hurrians also from Anatolia. Again, you have Mesopotamia. You have the Aegean, the Sea Peoples. They're all in this region. And so their idea is, again, if you take option number two, is like, look, there was a flood here and we've got the Nephilim issue. I mean, the Greeks know about this with the Titan story. The, the Hittites write about this. The Mesopotamians write about this with the Apkalu. Okay, they all know about th that there was a great flood. And this flood was a regional local event and not every person and not every one of these guys was killed. You had some survive and they become the progenitors of the Nephilim later that we get during the days of Moses and Joshua. So one of the issues. Okay, a couple things right here. So Heiser is the first place where I heard the table of nations argument. And this is one area I actually agree with Heiser on a lot of things. I totally disagree with him here. I'm with him on the Nephilim stuff and the sons of God and all of that. I actually have another podcast with my friend Alex that has uh, come out of the gate swinging. It's doing very well called My Strange Bible. If you're interested in that stuff, feel free to go check it out. It's on YouTube or your podcast player. There's a big difficulty with this though. So Heiser himself actually has you know, expressed multiple different views uh, that are possible for how you get the Nephilim. This is specifically what he's talking about, which Gavin's going to mention too, how you get the Nephilim both before and after the flood. Funny enough, the most recent uh, episode of My Strange Bible delved into this. So if you're interested in, in more of that, you can go check that out. But I don't think the local flood view actually works for this. And I'll tell you why. It's a real simple thing. Okay. It's one thing to say that God didn't take out all the animals of the earth with the flood. I, I believe the text says he did, but let's just, you know, for the sake of argument, it's one thing to say he didn't do that, okay? It's one thing to say that he didn't take out all the humans. But if the express purpose of the flood was to rid the world of the evil and corruption that are explained in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, right? In Genesis 5 and onward is where we see the flood start to take place, right? That whole narrative. Okay. If the express purpose of the flood is to destroy the evil that was a result of, of, of this event in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, you're telling me that God, you know, didn't actually accomplish that goal? God didn't wipe out all of the evil that resulted from the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men and created the Nephilim that resulted in the, uh, the you know, in, in man's heart being it, it, his thoughts only evil continually? You know, that seems odd to me. It seems very odd to me that God would not have been able to accomplish that task such that some of these creatures survived the flood. So I'm just not convinced at all by that take on the flood issue. And of course, I don't think the actual context gets, you know, localized by Genesis 10. I think it's just the, those were the only people alive on the whole world. So, of course, those are the nations that were mentioned. Okay, I digress. Let's keep moving. The issues there that he's addressing is this possibility of the Nephilim surviving. I'd love to do another video on who are the Nephilim. That's a fascinating question. A lot of people are interested in that. But the point for now is just that these people or figures, whoever they are, are listed in, in Genesis 6 right before the flood. And then they seem to come up later in Numbers 13 when the Hebrew spies bring this report. Now, unless this language is referring to people who aren't biologically related to the Nephilim of Genesis 6, which is possible, but seems less likely, then a lot of people would see in this further support that the flood wasn't absolutely universal. I, I don't put a lot of weight on that myself. I'm kind of uncertain about the Nephilim issue, but I mention it in case it's of interest to others. What I think is pretty decisive is the local sphere of reference and awareness reflected in Genesis 10. And again here, the driving goal is simply what is the meaning of the text? What is the text trying to do? It sets the agenda. How, how the text uses language should be our concern. We have to adjust to it rather than drag it into our concerns.
And sometimes we bring a lot onto the text. We have to remember this is an ancient document. So it's it, it used language that reflected, you know, the fact that the scripture is, is as, as not every one of my viewers believes this, but as, as a follower of Christ, I believe the scripture is the word of God. I, I really believe it is God's communication down to the little details. And I have a high view of scripture because I think Christ himself did. But a high view of scripture doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't use ordinary language. It's not like people are going to speak really technically and formally just because God is speaking through them. Actually, the Bible uses a lot of ordinary idiom. And I think the Bible's doing that here in Genesis 6 through 8. A final consideration. Of course, I, I agree with that, and uh, I believe that the Bible uses a lot of phenomenology, which is just people describing the way they see the world around them. You know, again, in my opinion here, and I mean this respectfully, but in my opinion, I just don't see how that creates any more of an argument for a local flood than for a global flood. Consideration for that is that within the text of Genesis 6 through 9, there are times where it's awkward to take Kol Eretz as all of planet Earth. And so to make this point, I thought the, the, this video from the YouTube channel Inspiring Philosophy made this point better than I could, so I'll show his little clip here. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole Earth. Well, wait a minute. I thought verse 5 said the tops of the mountains were seen. Now, there's another podcast episode where I responded uh, to this, me and my buddy Mark, and it's a response video to Inspiring Philosophy. And on this particular point, which many of my commenters actually, even people who are on his side, thought this was a pretty weak point, I, I think, unfortunately, I think this actually presses the text for a sense of literality that not even the young earth creationist is trying to get to. It seems certainly possible to me that the tops of the mountains could be seen while the whole earth is still covered with water. That itself does not seem problematic to me at all. Again, ordinary, normal language, not this, you know, overly technical description of things, as Gavin himself just alluded to. But in verse 9, it says the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. If this literally means the whole planet, the passage contains a contradiction. But if it was just a regional flood, and verse 9 is talking about how the waters had not receded from the region, which was the entirety of the flood, the passage makes more sense. The waters had not receded from the whole land, which was originally flooded but the mountains in the distance were still seen. The problem, I think, with this is that if the mountains in the distance were, were still seen, okay, then the people knew that there was land beyond their immediate region, right? When the argument so far has been that they only knew about the region, the land that, that, that they were in. So, I mean, yeah, I agree that, that the mountains in the distance were seen, but yet the whole face of the earth was covered. That makes perfect sense on a global flood view, but I don't think that makes sense on a local flood view because now you've got this region being written about that they're not really supposed to know about for the local flood view to make sense, right? This also makes sense with something that I said after this, where it says the waters were dried off the earth. Okay, this obviously doesn't refer to the whole earth because we still have massive oceans, but it would make sense if it refers to the regional area and that the waters receded from that region, not the whole earth. So, so just to make a, a brief point here, it's not the presence of water that's the problem, right? I mean, in the beginning, we had basically a continental landmass, and then we had the uh, oceans separated out from that. And some creationists also believe there was sort of another continental landmass that would have been kind of like a floating forest ecosystem, okay? But at least from the text of Scripture, you know, we can deduce that we had a, a, a one plot of land, right? One continental landmass, and then the oceans of the world, okay? Something like Virginia or Pangea. That comes directly from the text of Scripture. It's a scientific deduction that creationists have, have long uh, held to that comes directly from the text of Scripture, okay? And so the fact that there were oceans after the flood wouldn't have been any more problem than there being oceans before the flood, right? The presence of water isn't the problem. It's the global flood, right? The presence of water covering the whole land and killing all life on earth, except for Noah and his family. That's where the problem would have been. So the point is simply that interpreting Kol Eretz consistently, meaning all the planets, you know, everywhere there's nothing but water that you can see leads to some difficulties in reading the text. It seems better to allow this language to be more flexible and less exacting and more having reference to human perception and the ordinary way that we even tend to talk today sometimes. Now, let me address an objection at this point, and that's someone might say, if that's really a natural way to read the text, why did no one read it that way prior to the modern era? Doesn't that show that this reading is just a concession to modern science? And in response to that, I would say two things. First, I would say 
I understand why some Christians are very skeptical of things advanced in the name of science, because sometimes science can be weaponized. But I also think it's wrong to adopt a totally skeptical posture towards science. I think that's unhelpful. I think we should seek to harmonize general and special revelation. And that means there's no way around the hard task of trying to distinguish between good scientific claims and bad scientific claims. And I don't think it's helpful to have a posture of just total skepticism toward that task. And I've gone into that a little bit more in my response to Ken Ham, the second video responding to him on creation. So I won't really dwell on that point here. I'll just make a more basic point. There do seem to be pre-modern exegetes who interpret the flood as local. It's less common, but you can find that. A lot of times they're just not thinking in our same categories today in the pre-modern era. But one and uh, certainly this is true, but again, just looking at the way that church history has interpreted this text for the last few thousand years, it doesn't seem odd that the science was not a concern for them at all. And yet, you know, Gavin says, well, yeah, you can find a few references here and there, but what that implies is that, yes, overwhelmingly, he agrees that church history has primarily viewed this as a global event. Okay, so yeah, you can find a few people who had ideas about it throughout church history other than that. But for the most part, this view has come up because of modern science. And I, I think, you know, we just have to be honest about that. I think him starting with the Bill Maher video in the beginning sort of betrays that same kind of thinking. You know, I really want to believe, uh, I think Gavin's a great guy, I really do. And I really want to believe that he's motivated primarily by the text here. I haven't been convinced of that from watching this video. So I'm, I'm just being honest, kind of for where I stand. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. But it seems to me like the science really is the deciding factor for a lot of people, perhaps not Gavin, but for a lot of people it seems to be. And I just think that's unfortunate. But one example would be Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, probably the foremost ancient Jewish historian. And he is not known for having wild and fanciful interpretations of the Hebrew Bible. He's often quite literal and conservative in his reading of the Hebrew Bible, but he references the others who are afraid to come down from the mountains after the flood and who then follow the example of Noah's sons in repopulating the plains. So Noah's sons are the first ones who come down and then they follow their example. It sounds like- I admit, I have never heard this argument before from jo Josephus. If anybody has information about this, I'd love for you to let me know about it so I can research it a little bit more. It does seem odd, though, because he's such a respected Jewish historian. Like, why didn't so many of his fellow Jews have the same sort of belief about these other people who were apparently in the mountains who were waiting for the flood waters to recede? Like, it's just an odd view that kind of comes out of nowhere, you know, over and against the predominant view that he was facing sounds like he's just assuming there were other survivors. And that's how this passage in Josephus is often taken. The translator, Louis Feldman, who's probably the world's leading scholar in Josephus studies, takes it that way. I'll put up his statement about this as well. So the point is, there do seem to be, it, it, it's not just a modern innovation. Like so many of these things, and I made the same point with Augustine on other matters of Genesis. Actually, it's true. You know, I, this is really true, and I would just encourage people to not disbelieve me until you've looked into it for yourself. Ancient readers of scripture were not as literalistic as modern day fundamentalists. There was more flexibility, and we need to consider that. Okay, second argument. In well, again, especially if you go to that other video I mentioned uh, in a response to IP, I think I think a lot of times it's unfortunate that, you know, quote unquote fundamentalists are sort of given this label as being so overly literalistic. Um, I, I really want to make a distinction between this sort of wooden literalism and just reading the text in a natural, ordinary way. And, you know, I honestly think the young age creationist does this more consistently than many of our critics. Envisioning a global flood requires multiplying miracles that are not mentioned in the text. Now, I want to be very clear here that this is not a matter of God's omnipotence. God can do anything. God can totally make a global flood. God can make a flood the size of our solar system. <laughs> if he wanted to, he can create all the water he wants. He's omnipotent. I'm perfectly happy to believe in miracles when the Bible records them. And obviously in the flood story, there's a lot of miracles. When B.B. Warfield was once asked, what is Christianity? His simple reply was unembarrassed supernaturalism. I like that. And I'm not embarrassed about miracles. I think it's rational to believe that miracles can occur. The question is, what are the miracles that are actually in the text? And I think in general, an interpretation of scripture is weakened when it requires you to start positing more and more miracles miracles that aren't recorded in the text, in many cases are not implied by the text, and especially so if some of these miracles are pretty fantastic, pretty ad hoc. Okay. Another way to state this concern is to say, often an appeal will be made for a, a global flood on the basis of a natural reading. We're told this is just a natural way to read the text. And I can sympathize truly with, with people who feel that way. But again, sometimes things get more complicated with time the more you think about it. I've been thinking about this for 25 years now, and it does get more complicated the more you stare at it. This appeal to a natural reading starts to become less natural when you start to actually conceptualize all that it entails and all the miracles that need to be inserted into the story that actually aren't in the text. Let me give five examples. And in saying these, I'm not trying to be insulting or to make fun of anything. I'm just trying to draw out what a global flood really involves. So we need to understand what we're asking of people if we insist this is the only way to have a high view of scripture. Five examples. Number one is the transportation of 
animals to the ark and then back afterwards from all around the globe. Genesis 6.20 says the two of every sort of animal shall come into you. But it says nothing about a kind of miraculous transportation from their original location, nor back to it when the flood is over. It just... So just remember that their original location was not the original location that you would possibly think, like a kangaroo coming from Australia or a penguin coming from Antarctica. And he's going to mention that. But just keep in mind that that's not the creationist view. The creationist view is that there is one continental landmass, and we'll get into this more in a minute as well. But the creationist view is also that most modern day species that we have today weren't even alive back then. Okay, It was the biblical kinds, whatever those were. It just basically says that the flood subsides and they got off the ark. Now, this is going to be miraculous anyway you slice it, but the miracles are in a different register when you think about a global flood. So just picture, you know, Arctic wolves in northern Canada, kangaroos and wallabies and marsupials in Australia, the various species of indigenous animals to Madagascar, a little island off the coast of Southeast Africa, poison dart frogs in the rainforests of Brazil, giant salamanders in the freshwater pools of Japan, mm -hmm. llamas in the Andes Mountains of Peru and Bolivia, penguins in the South Pole, giant tortoises in the Galapagos Islands. I try to think of like some of my favorite animals. I love animals. We lived in St. Louis for two years. They have a great free zoo. We'd go to the zoo all the time. I find animals fascinating. And so, you know, so I'd like to get specific with this, not trying to poke fun at this, but trying to put it out there as a legitimate curiosity to ask, how did this happen? How well, and the answer to that is that it didn't happen. Just, again, it didn't happen. That's not what creationists believe. We do believe that God brought the animals that needed to be on the ark to the ark. But again, the number of animals would have been dramatically less. The kinds of animals would have been dramatically different. And the places from which they needed to come would not have been like what they are today. How did they get all get to the ark? How did they all return to their respective territories? How did they cross oceans to get there in some cases? How did they survive being so out of their ordinary environment? If it was a natural process of migration, why do we have no fossil records whatsoever of that? You know, all the kangaroo fossils are only on in Australia. All the ring-tailed lemur fossils are only in Madagascar, etc. Now, there's explanations for this. You can go and read the Young Earth Creationist websites and books and find various explanations. And I'm not trying to deride them, but I'm trying to say those explanations are not in the text. You have to add a bunch of miracles that don't they're, they're not in the text, and they don't even seem to be implied by the text, especially in the case of their return after the flood. Well, one of the, one of the concerns here about going beyond the text, let's just say so two things about this. First, people who read the Bible have to go beyond the text all the time because the text doesn't give exhaustive instructions for everything that we have to do in our lives. So I'm not really sure uh, where Gavin's coming from on this, like why he's making such a huge deal about going beyond the text, both in theology and just personal, daily, our, our Christian walk, there's lots of things that we have to go beyond the text for. We just can't cross the text, right? Um, the other thing is, is that we are asking questions, to Gavin's own point that he made earlier, that the original readers of the Bible would not have been asking. We are interested in how animals get from here to there and transportation and all of this because we have this global scope and scale that they didn't have. They didn't need all this information. So in my view, the, the demand, in a sense, for this extra information is the problem. It's not the fact that we are, you know, trying to fill in the gaps. We're doing that because of who we are. The ancient readers would not have needed all of these gaps filled in because that's not how they were thinking about the world. So we're only going beyond the text in the sense that we're asking additional questions of the text that the original readers would not have wanted or needed to or even known to. The flood is over. So for that interpretation to work, you've got to add all these extra miracles. Second example, the quantity of animals on the ark. The Bible tells us how big the ark is. By the way, it's probably not as big as the ark in Kentucky associated with Answers in Genesis. Some of you may have visited that ark before. I've never been. Uh, but they use a disputed interpretation of the word. Let me just say, Gavin, you should go. A lot of the questions that you have, I think, will be addressed there. They even talk a lot about, he's getting ready to mention the idea of the cubit. They talk a lot about why they decided on the, cu the cubit measurement that they did. They have that listed in various displays and things there, and they've written about it in certain books that they've, you know, th that they've written. I mean... You know, I'm not even on, on some things, I'm not the, always the biggest fan of Answers in Genesis. I think sometimes they make an enemy out of other young earth creationists, which is a little unfortunate. But I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt on a couple of these things. If you're going to spend millions of dollars of donor money and also your own uh, money on, a, on an arc, on a life-size arc, I, you know, I'd like to think that it's a pretty well-researched project. And that they did a pretty good job on it. And so, I, and I tend to agree with that. I, I think they did. And, you know, I think Gavin should go sometime. And maybe you should too. The word cubit 
Typically, that's taken up around 18 inches. Even the classic Younger Creationist text, the Genesis Flood, defines a cubit as 17.5 inches. But to build the Ark in Kentucky, they defined it as a little more than 20 inches, if I understand correctly. So that makes it 510 feet long. It's probably a little less than that. But that's not 100% certain. People dispute the meaning of cubit. So let's give them that extra space. Fine. It's still a lot to fit all the animals of the world into the Ark. And so the way this breaks down is people have to talk through, how do you define the biblical word kind? Older Younger Creationists will talk, you know, it'll be like 30,000 and total animals, something like that, including all the pairs. More recently, though, they bring the number way down. So Answers in Genesis and some other young earth creationist ministries will have just a couple thousand animals sometime. And the way they're able to do that is by defining the word kind very broadly. So I want to point something out here because the way that that was worded, I think, was a little unfortunate. I'm not sure that he meant this, but I want to make it clear that creationists don't define the word kind the way that we do so that we can fit animals on the ark. Okay, and again, I'm not saying he's accusing us of that, but it kind of sounded like it, and so I want to make that clear. Okay, the word kind is hard to define. Biblically, there are some guidelines and, and guardrails, and uh, the same is true with the science. There's work being done by creationists to get to the truth of the matter. Baromenology is a whole field of study dedicated to that. So the the level of kind, which this is kind of fascinating, Michael Behe, who is a evolutionist in the sense that he believes in universal common ancestry, wrote a book called Darwin Devolves. And in it, he made the case that evolutionary changes, the mechanisms of evolution actually create devolution, not evolution. In other words, they take away information, not add new information. And, and, and it's typically breaking functionality, not adding new functionality. And Gavin is going to go into this, that this idea that a, a creationist draws the line at the level of like family or order. It's a little bit of a blurry line between family and order where the original kinds probably were. But note that that's not so that we could fit animals on the ark, okay? It's because that seems to be the best evidence that we have of where that line can be drawn. And this recent work by Dr. Behe lended more credence to that. In fact, I interviewed him for one of my old podcasts a couple years ago. You can probably still find it about this. And I made this point. I'm not really sure how he felt about it. Um, but I made this point that he kind of confirmed what young earth creationists have been saying. The, the broad idea of the point that he made is that he doesn't believe that the Darwinian mutation selection mechanism can get you beyond family or order, okay, in the Linnaean classification system. The family or order level is the point at which he believes that some sort of creation, some sort of divine supernatural intelligence had to have interfered. So for a creationist to say that that's the same exact level where the original creation was makes sense. The thing is, is Behe's book was published in 2018 or 19, I can't remember, somewhere in there. And creationists have been saying this since the mid 80s, at least. So kind of fascinating. And I always love when those kind of confirmations come into play. But yeah, it's not so that we can fit more animals on the ark. And another thing, and I'll mention it here so I don't have to mention it later, he's going to talk about the care for the animals as well. There's a study that was done, and I'll try to remember to link to it in the show notes. Otherwise, uh, feel free to just search this online. It's called the Ark Feasibility Study by John Woodmerap. And this was done, I believe, in the late 90s. And all sorts of factors were considered about the size of the ark, how many animals it could fit, the care and feeding that would go into it, and the numbers that he came up with allowable based on the size that he believed the ark was were more than plentiful for the amount of animals that we have going on the ark right now. I can't remember the exact number. I want to say the number he came up with was like 14,000 animals. It may have been way more, but I want to say it was like 14,000, something like that. Whereas our latest estimates are, have us like two to 3,000, somewhere in there in terms of the amount of animals that would have actually needed to be on the ark. So there's more than enough space for the animals themselves, for Noah and his family, and for the caretaking of the animals to take place. Yes, they probably came up with some innovative solutions. I think the ark encounter makes some great suggestions there, although we're, we'll never know. Those do go beyond the text. I don't think that's a big problem, but okay. So setting all that groundwork, now we'll let Gavin talk about it. So one article that answers in Genesis uses the word kind as similar to the word family in our modern taxonomy of animals. So that's an even broad, the word family in, in modern classification of animals is even broader than the term species. Sorry, even broader, well, certainly broader than species, even broader than the word genus. Uh, I'll, I'll put this up. You can see in the yellow uh, on the picture I'm putting up. This would mean there's like one 
dog animal or one cat animal. So basically what this results in is extremely rapid evolution after the flood, lightning speed evolution. A little more than 4,000 years ago, you have just two animals of the cat kind. And then today you have the dozens of species and all the different genuses that descend from just those two animals, lions and tigers and cheetahs and jaguars and panthers and leopards and lynxes and bobcats and pumas and wildcats and all the way down to domestic cats. They all come in less than 5,000 years from two animals uh, on the ark. Same with the horse family or kind. You get zebras and donkeys and all the different kinds of horses from those two animals in less than 5,000 years. In the dog kind or family, you get all the different dog species, uh, wolves, coyotes, foxes, jackals, etc. Also, you know, in incredible lightning speed evolution. And it's kind of ironic that the people who believe in the most powerful form of evolution are often the young earth creationists because they have to squeeze it into this tiny time frame. And even though sometimes they won't use the word evolution, you know, here's another quote I'll put up from an answers in Genesis. Okay, so I, I want to comment on this while these words are up on the screen. Right, we don't use the word evolution. That's for a particular reason, okay? If you want to use the word evolution, that's fine. Note that the idea of change over time is not the problem. You know, Gavin said, and he's not the first person to say this, you know, the worst evolutionists are the creationists, you know. Um, actually, I think the first engagement I ever had with that language was Hugh Ross. Hugh Ross said that, ironically, you know, the young earth creationists are, are worse evolutionists than even the evolutionists. Well, that misses the point, okay? The problem is is not the the process of change, right? All those things you see on the screen if you're watching, genetic drift, natural selection, you know, mutation. Um, these are viable mechanisms in what, you know, in, in, in modern day evolutionists, they call speciation. I prefer to refer to it as diversification, rapid diversification of these species. Either way you slice it, the change over time is not the problem. Now, I'm admitting that, yeah, that's a lot of change over time. There are probably some additional mechanisms at play, still very speculative in the creationist research. What else beyond epigenetics and uh, the things that you see here uh, might have gone into that? But still, the change over time happening in the amount of time we're talking about is not the problem. The reason why it's misleading to call this evolution, quote unquote, is because usually the word evolution is referred to talking about the Darwinian synthesis of evolution taking place over millions of years. The problem is the time scale because there are theological issues, big theological issues that is like other than, okay, well, this is what the Bible says. The theological issues are the big reason why one would be a young earth creationist. And I think at some point I will probably do a video and podcast episode on the idea of the theology of why a global flood view actually matters. But again, I don't mind the time scale that this change is happening in. The problem is, is when you make the change happen over the time scale that seems to deny the text of scripture and seems to create theological problems, you know, for Christians. Genesis article, it's not using the word evolution, but it's the same mechanisms, genetic drift, natural selection, mutation, etc. Now, I'm not trying to pick on answers in Genesis here uh, or isolate them. Sometimes I'll, nor, nor am I trying to say this is the only way you could work as a, as a young earth creationist. It's one representative example. Sometimes when I quote from a young earth creationist source, people will get angry and say, I'm not quoting from the best of the movement. I don't always know what the best is. And I think it's fair game to quote from what's commonly known and what's influential and what's out there. But if you don't have... True enough, but I also think that we always should be trying to engage with the best material that's out there. You know, Richard Carrier is common and influential and it's out there and all of that, but you wouldn't quote him for historical Jesus studies or reference him for historical Jesus studies if you were trying to do an honest critique of the best information available. So the thing is, it's not that hard to find great information these days. Yeah, I mean, I think the big three are still putting out some great information, even though I disagree with some of what they write and produce. I really love following Dr. Todd Wood and Paul Garner, their podcast called Let's Talk Creation. Love engaging with Dr. Marcus Ross and his materials. And, and some of the people that I interview on my podcast, of course, are, you know, I, I really love following them as well. So there's great information that's available. You do have to be willing to go find it. And, you know, especially when you're talking about things that deal with science, when you are talking about things that deal with science, the difference between an article written in 2018 and an article or a book written in 2024 could be in two entirely different things, let alone when you go even longer than that. Lightning speed evolution, then you have to have more species on the ark. And so there's a trade-off here one way or another, either more animals or more evolution. However you negotiate that trade-off, it's really hard to imagine all land-dwelling vertebrate animals getting onto the ark. Especially, so you have to get more miracles, one way or another, that, that aren't in the text. And that's especially true because of what I think is probably the most underrated difficulty, and that's number three example that I'm going to give, and that's the care for these animals while they're on the ark. So if you've ever worked at a zoo, you know how much goes into caring for animals, how easy disease can be, and so forth, even if you just had a pet. <laughs> we're thinking about getting a dog, and so we're thinking about all this. Okay, in this case, you have all the animals of the entire world. 
at least in their kind, and you have eight people caring for them for more than a year in extremely taxing conditions. So you got the seven days of loading up and then about 370 days when they're on the ark if you add up all the different events together. And there's only eight people, Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives, and they have to provide ventilation, sanitation, proper temperatures, fresh food, and fresh water for all of these animals, all the animals of the world for over a year. If you think that through, <laughs> Let's not get too graphic, you know, but you think through all that that is involved with it. So it's just, just thinking of the food and water you have to supply. I mean, some of these animals are special climate animals like polar bears, and they have to live alongside. Okay, I have, I have to stop here before it gets too far. Number one, don't forget about that ARC feasibility study I told you about where a lot of the caretaking was mentioned. Okay. Number two, let's not like – Gavin, again, when it, when it comes to this idea of going beyond the text, I don't really think that we need – or that the original readers needed for God to spell out the details of how the animals were cared for. I expect that kind of detail about how things should be done when it comes to building the temple or the tabernacle, and we have that kind of detail in the text because that's important for theological reasons. The theology of the flood does not require us to have an expose on how Noah and his family were supposed to care for the ark. I think those are modern questions that ancient readers wouldn't have cared about. It's fun for us to ask those questions and speculate on how it went down, but, you know, again, for the most part, I, I think it's totally fine that those things are not in the text and we're free to speculate on those as modern people. Um, polar bears would not have been on the ark. Again, so again, the bear kind, that whole idea, like uh, the, the almost certainly there was not these different, uh, wildly different ecosystems in the pre-flood world. I mean, there was wildly different ecosystems, but I, I, you know, if there was one bear kind, then probably we're not dealing with like a polar bear and then something else as the world shifted after the flood which there's a whole other can of worms there as to how places like Antarctica and the Arctic in general would have been formed actually by the flood, completely different subject matter. Suffice it to say, a polar bear would not have been on the flood, so he's going to go through this and some other examples about special climate animals that would have needed special care on the ark. Yes, of course, some animals on the ark would have needed special kinds of care, but I don't think it's anything near the extent that, unfortunately, Gavin is, is bringing up in this video alongside animals that are used to the desert. Some of them are special diet animals, like koala bears, which eat eucalyptus tree leaves, which are only grown in Australia. Uh, one of the big challenges is for insects and tidal pool creatures and other small invertebrate animals. You'd almost need something like what are the equivalent of modern-day aquariums for taking some care of many of these smaller animals. Now, whether insects are on the ark is a disputed question. A lot of people, young earth creationists, will say, well, some insects may have been in that kind of thing. One, but, you know, there's different explanations. The point is, whatever explanation you go with, you've got to go way beyond the text to try to make it work. For example, one theory that comes from Bede in the early church or late patristic, early medieval church, and is picked up in the book The Genesis Flood is that all the animals hibernated. So you can see this theory as it's put up. This book, The Genesis Flood, is one that's often credited with launching the modern young earth creationist movement as such. It has this proposal that God instructed certain of the animals through impartation of a migratory directional instinct, which would afterward be inherited in greater or lesser degree by their descendants to flee from their native habitats to the place of safety. Then, having entered the ark, they also received from God the power to become more or less dormant in various ways in order to be able to survive for the year in which they were to be confined within the ark while the great storms and convuls convulsions raged outside. So now God can do that. God is omnipotent. My <laughs> I disagree with that whole explanation of things for what it's worth. But again, this was a view picked up in a book that launched the creationist movement in 1961. And we've done a lot of work since then. So it's still out there, of course. And so it's probably fair game to quote. I, I agree. But like there has been a lot of thinking on these issues that goes beyond just what was written in the Genesis flood in 1961. Gosh, 60 years ago now. So my point that I'm trying to raise here is that that goes beyond the text. A global migratory instinct, universal hibernation, you know, all of this requires us to start stacking up more and more miracles. And if you don't have those miracles, you need some other kind of miracle to explain how do eight people for more than a year care for all the animals of the entire world. And what I'm trying to help us see is not, I'm not trying to make fun of this view or make someone... F I, I, I started to stop it again, but I, I wanted to point out the word miracle is a little difficult here. For example... Uh, if you go to the Ark Encounter and see how they sort of suggested the care for the animals, it's not a miracle. Ancient people were fantastic engineers. Read the book, Searching for Adam, Genesis and the Truth About Man's Origin. Some fascinating research in there, just into the engineering marvels of ancient people. To think that ancient people could not have engineered a solution to care for all these animals, I think is just... A, a sort of chronological bias or, or something. It wouldn't have been a miracle to do that, okay? So I, I'm just, I'm a little puzzled 
by Gavin's use of the word miracles here. I think some of these things aren't miracles. They're just sort of logical deductions or either, you know, human ingenuity that could have gone into this. And I don't know, perhaps a trip to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky would do Gavin good to kind of see some of the different ways that creationists have been thinking about this stuff for a few years. So I I think I'm just going to object to the word miracle being used here quite a bit. I think of a miracle as something different than a lot of the things that he's brought up would feel like they're being mocked or something like that. It's not my intention. What I'm trying to help us feel is to reduce the sense that this is the only way you can read this text and that this is the natural reading. Because if you start thinking it through, it seems a little less natural the more you think about it. Example four, which I get from David Snoke's helpful book that addresses this, is where did all this water come from? To cover the Himalayan mountains and all the mountains of the world, the Andes Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, you need water that would go about six miles above sea level. We just don't have that. That, that quantity of water simply does not exist. So you either have a miraculous creation and destruction of additional water, or you'd have the extremely rapid formation of mountains in connection with the flood or soon thereafter. So that Mount Everest. Not to be unkind, but this is, uh, again, one of the oldest, you know, oldest tricks in the book in terms of an argument against the creationist literature. And it's been answered just exhaustively so many times. And I think more than convincingly, probably for more than 20 years in the creationist literature has been pretty detailed information on how the mountains would have formed as a result of the cataclysmic and catastrophic flood. And uh, there's lots of videos you can find on the Is Genesis History channel, specifically detailing a lot of this specific information on how these mountains could have been formed and probably were formed as a result of the flood. So in my opinion, this is sort of a non-issue. Where did all the water come from? It wouldn't have needed to be that much water because the mountains that we currently see on the earth today would not have been there in the pre-flood world. Mount Everest is just a few thousand years old. So this would mean this kind of global cataclysmic reshaping of geology to create these deep basins in the ocean to drain the water into and to shoot up these mountains super fast. fast. Yes, it it would mean that. And that's exactly what creationists believe and teach. Fast, basically immediately. Now that's possible, but again, it's just going beyond the text. All the text credits for ending the flood is a wind that God sends to make the waters subside. Fifth example would be what, how do plants and trees survive? What about water animals? You know, if you mix, I've read a lot of the different theories about how the fish and water animals can survive when you mix fresh water and salt water. And there's all kinds of interesting theories about that. Another question you have to explain is how do trees and plants and, and then insects come in with this as well? How did they all survive? One of the theories that's referenced in the Genesis flood book is the idea of floating vegetation rafts. And some people say that the insects could have been on those. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to say that's the only proposal, but that's one idea. If you don't have those kinds of explanations, you need something else. One way or another, you've got to support. Again, none of these things are miracles, the, right? I mean, these are just things that can happen in the natural world. Floating vegetation mats and even log rafts and things like that um, are, are part of many evolutionary stories about um, animal migration patterns and things of that nature. So, um, again, I just don't think these are miracles supply all these additional miracles to make sense of the text. So I hope, I hope I'm articulating my concern there in a way that's respectful, but also gets across how difficult this is and why a lot of us would say if the language is can be permissibly and responsibly used for a local reference, that seems like it makes a lot more sense. Okay. Now, to be clear, if it's a local flood, it's still miraculous. The transportation of the animals, the sending of water, God's communication with Noah, all of that requires God's meticulous involvement, his intervention, and so forth. But the point is that the kinds of miracles associated with a local flood seem to fit better with the transportation of the animals, the size of the ark, the number of people involved, the amount of time involved, etc. At the very least, allowing for a local flood should not be written off as a liberalism or as just not taking the Bible seriously, as so often happens. For me personally, you know, I, just to speak personally, I'm not just a total theology nerd who's, in, who's uh, I mean, I love theology, but I think about these things at a pastoral and personal level. I've been through my, my time of working through, how do I think this through? I know a lot of others have as well. For me personally, adhering to a local flood, as what I think is much more likely, is my best effort to submit to the text and what I think it's intending to convey in its own context, reading the Bible. This is kind of just a, a helpful point for the future, but, you know, again, like I mentioned, you know, before, If that's the case, maybe not starting the video with a Bill Maher clip would be, you know, a wise approach in the future. Again, I really want to believe Gavin here. I I know that he is very serious about the text, and I know many people who are local flood proponents who are very serious about the text of Scripture. Um, You know, but but it's hard not to believe, and, and please understand where we're coming from. It's just really hard not to believe as a creationist that modern science does not have a influential factor in this. It, it must. It, it just simply must. Probably Dr. William Lane Craig is one of the most honest people I've heard on this point. I mean, he he has, on various occasions, has honestly said that even though he's trying to grapple with the text and the science separately, he has admitted a, as much on various occasions that the science absolutely causes him havoc, you know, when it comes to this issue of, of creationism, that it, it's certainly a factor in his thinking. 
And, um, you know, it's just hard not to believe that that's uh, a factor somewhere in Gavin's thinking as well. Um, so we should take his word for it. I'm not wanting to judge his motive, but uh, it would probably help his case next time if he didn't start out with a Bill Maher clip. The Bible responsibly and well as an ancient document that is true, but using ancient language and an ancient sphere of reference. Okay. Final section of the video. Let me conclude by making a case that I think we can believe in the flood story as a credible and true historical event. Because the other, you know, I feel multiple pressures when I make a video like this. From one side, it's from, I know some Christians will say I'm compromising. But the other pressure, and I, I don't think I am, but I'm trying. And by the way, I detest when creationists use the word compromise. So if that's you, please stop. Be nice. Gavin is clearly not a liberal. He's not a compromiser. Um, yeah, let's not use that language. Let's be nice to each other. Let's be winsome. You know, let's try to win people like Gavin with evidence instead of calling him names, you know? I'm trying to respectfully interact with that and push back. The other pressure I feel is from skeptics or others outside the Christian faith or even some who are Christians who might feel like, they might feel like Bill Maher. Like, this story is crazy. Like, why would anybody take this story seriously? So let me address that concern. Something that is interesting is how many extra biblical ancient texts also have reference to a flood story, some of them in remarkably similar ways to the story of Genesis 6 through 8. One of them is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Another is the Epic of Atrahasis, Atrahasis, I think you pronounce it. And the similarities between these stories and the biblical story get down to their details. They're very interesting. You know, uh, there's really important theological differences, but some of, the, some of the details are quite amazing that, you know, the role of uh, a dove and a raven afterwards in finding the land, for example, finding the dry ground. Although some of the Babylonian accounts include a swallow as well. But so I'm not trying to overpress the similarities, but there's enough similarities that you say, this is fascinating. How do you explain that? And one good view is that there's, it's not a question of borrowing one from the other, but that they have a collective shared memory. So people call them cognates, which means basically they, neither one is borrowing from the other. They're just a part of the shared memory of this ancient event. And then beyond these specific similarities, you find many other legends all throughout the ancient world that are recalling this massive cataclysmic flood event. Ken Keithley and Mark Rooker argue that there are 68 distinct such stories extending to all places all around the world. And they... So actually, I think there are more than that. The information that I've received has between three to 500 of these flood stories, some obviously bearing closer similarity than others, but they do come from all over the world. Personally, I think this is probably a little better explained on the global flood view than the local flood view for scientific reasons. But, you know, at the very least, the argument that he's making here for its historicity applies equally to the local flood or to the global flood view. So again, he's just making the general case for historicity here in this event. I totally agree, but I think it makes more sense if this flood was totally global, especially since you have cultures even in you know, the Americas that have these sorts of stories. And you know, depending on what your stance is on evolution and the timelines and things like that, the way that they shake out, it'd be kind of odd for some of these stories to have traveled the way that they did on a local flood view. And they say no comparable event in biblical history has the same extra biblical attestation as the flood in the history of religion and world history. Now, the appeal here would be basically to say, even if you think this story is just a myth in the Bible or is just a crazy story with no historical backing behind it, then you have to find some kind of explanation for where all these legends came from. And there's actually good reasons to believe there's some kind of huge catastrophic event in ancient history that lived on in the memory of various cultures and inspired these various stories. The only question then would be the relation between the historical event and these various stories. So let me give one example. Two scientists wrote a, a fascinating book arguing that there was a vast flood around the year five. 1600 BC that resulted in what we today call the Black Sea. Now, this is not a Christian book. These are just two scientists. The book's description says using sound waves and coring devices to probe the sea floor, William Ryan and Walter Pittman revealed clear evidence that this inland body of water had once been a vast freshwater lake lying hundreds of feet below the level of the world's rising oceans. Sophisticated dating techniques confirmed that 7,600 years ago, the mounting seas had burst through the narrow Bosphorus Valley and the salt water of the Mediterranean had poured into the lake with unimaginable force, racing over beaches and up rivers, destroying or chasing all life before it. Commenting on this book, Trumper Longman and John Walton comment, Ryan and Pittman's thesis is intriguing. Before they encountered this evidence, they doubted that the biblical flood story had any reference to a real historical event. Rather, it was pure myth. Now they believe a real event stands behind the flood story. Now, I'm not trying to say that that exact proposal, 5,600 BC and the Black Sea, is the correct one. I'm an agnostic on the details. I don't know exactly how big and where and, and when this event occurred in, in the details. A lot of people have argued for a larger territory that would include the Black Sea, but also the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Caspian Sea, basically this huge chunk of the Middle East. And I'm not sure about that. I don't have a position. But my point is, there's actually good reasons for believing there was some kind of calamitous flood event that shaped ancient humanity profoundly and left its memory upon these very different cultures. And as long as we're not, we're careful not to overstate what the Bible requires people to believe, this story need not be a liability. It's actually pretty compelling, especially when you read the Bible at, in line with its intended meaning and not kind of mold it into modern science in, in an overly literalistic way. For the record, I don't really have an opinion on this. I, again, there are a lot of people with different views on the extent of a local flood since 
that's not my view. I don't really have a take on how that, you know, the science of that shakes out. At the very least, allowing for a local flood theory to be a Christian option is helpful for us right now, I think. Those of the Christians who are persuaded of that view should still be welcomed as members of our churches. Those investigating the Christian faith should not be required to take one option or the other just to be a Christian. That's my deepest concern. I think when we present the gospel to people, my deepest hope for my YouTube channel, as much as I'm diving into kind of some somewhat nerdy stuff here, I realize, uh, my deepest hope for my YouTube channel is that it will help people encounter Jesus himself. And his claims are already challenging and offensive enough. We don't want to put any additional burdens on people as they're negotiating their own relationship with Christ. Well, again, of course, totally agree. This is not a test for orthodoxy. Let's get you to Jesus, and then we'll try to get you to a global flood, you know, down, down the road maybe. But we do have to deal with the claims of Scripture and take Scripture seriously, and he believes that as well. You know, it also means that if the flood was global, right? So, yeah, I mean, just because Jesus' claims are challenging and offensive enough, if there's other things in the Bible, there are, by the way, that are challenging and offensive, like, those aren't, you know, shouldn't be erected as barriers to the gospel, but they are part of the biblical world and life view, and they're therefore very important. We should call people, we do want to make it clear to people that to follow Christ means we have to uphold the authority of Scripture, but that involves being honest about where there are legitimate differences of interpretation among Orthodox Christians. All right, I'll end it there. For Agreed. further reading, let me rec recommend this book that I've already read. All right, well, we're going to end it there as well. Uh, I hope this has been a helpful look. We've already gone on for a long time, so I'm not going to belabor too much here at the end. Please do, though, like, comment, share, subscribe, all of those sorts of things. If you're listening on audio, podcasts spread by word of mouth, if you think this was helpful and our other content is helpful, I would encourage you to please share it with as many people as you can to get the message of winsome creation out there. God bless, and we'll see you guys in the next one.